Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Our province's Justice Minister, Casey Medu, heard from Albertans today about whether we should have a provincial police force. Premier Jason Kenney announced a huge funding initiative to improve broadband service in both rural and Indigenous communities. And we hear about research being done at the University of Lethbridge, which is looking into a new pill that could combat COVID-19. Your nation. Your province. Your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Our province's Justice Minister and Solicitor General Casey Medieu made his way to the town of Cardston to discuss the hot-button topic of rural crime and how it's handled here in Alberta. Medieu stressed making a change to a provincial police force that would essentially phase out the current RCMP. Micah Quinn has the details. A report was done by a company called PricewaterhouseCoopers, or PwC, that studied the potential for a provincial police force. Medu says the idea for a new force for Albertans comes from complaints from rural communities that said that they didn't have enough police presence on the ground. A total of $286 million have been earmarked completely for more RCMP officers. And what I'm hearing right now again is that that even is not enough. So where is this going to end? So the need for us to really think through a new model. And based on the study that I have had the opportunity to take a look at, I am confident that we would have a more cost-effective police model. The National Police Federation launched a campaign called Keep Alberta RCMP that says if the Alberta government disbands the RCMP, Canadian taxpayers will be on the hook for $160 million as the federal government pays for about 30% of the RCMP's policing costs annually. The vast majority of Albertans are not interested at all in pursuing a provincial police force. Uh, recent polling has, has showed us that 81% um, uh, of Albertans served by the RCMP are very satisfied with the service they receive. They receive um, you know, 78% in the North rural, rural North communities, 81% in the rural central communities, and 87% in the rural south communities. Um, those are incredible numbers. Um, uh, so I guess, you know, the old adage goes, you know, if, if it ain't broke, why are we trying to fix it? The report from the PWC hasn't been made public yet, but Medu says he will let Albertans know when it's ready to be released. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. Justice Minister Casey Medu has written to the federal government saying that he would like to see Albertans being allowed to carry pepper spray as a legal way of protecting themselves. Currently, pepper spray is a prohibited weapon in Canada unless you're a police officer. Our legislative reporter, Tyler Dawson, says Medu feels pepper spray would help protect many of those who are most vulnerable in the larger centres. Casey Medu, as you say, has written to the federal justice minister asking that this rule be changed. You know, looking at some of the attacks against vulnerable people that we've seen in Alberta in the last little while, um, and basically arguing that, that this should be a, a self-defense option for people, you know, walking the streets of uh, major cities and whatnot. Our legislative reporter Tyler Dawson will also discuss how Medu is also calling for mandatory minimum sentencing for hate-based attacks. That interview is coming up in the second half of our program. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney announced today that his government would be investing over $100 million to improve broadband in both rural and Indigenous communities. Right now, about 80% of Indigenous communities don't have access to reliable internet in our province. Roughly 67% of rural communities cannot rely on a stable internet connection. And this just is no longer acceptable. Access to broadband uh, must help these, these Alberta communities continue to grow and participate in our economic recovery. So I am very excited to be here to announce that as a key part of Alberta's economic recovery plan, Alberta's government is dedicating at least $150 million to connect Albertans in rural, remote and Indigenous communities uh, to high-speed internet, to broadband, to the digital economy. Premier Kenny adds that around 201,000 Alberta households, or around 12% of the population, do not have access to target speed set out by the CRTC. More good news for Indigenous women living in Lethbridge. The Alberta and federal governments announced new funding for 14 safe and stable housing units for Blackfoot women and their children who were relocating from the Kainai, Siksika and Pakani First Nations. 
These women may be starting new jobs, attending school, fleeing difficult circumstances, or just looking for a safe and stable place to call home. The Blackfoot Family Lodge Society, you're like a family and community for the First Nations women and children. These planned new rental units are an investment in a promising future for Indigenous women and their families. Everyone deserves a safe, affordable, and accessible home. When Indigenous women and their children thrive, we're all going to be better off. There was always the need, it's just that we always fell short. I believe uh, the one that we have existing is, is very limited, and so a lot of times uh, uh, people want to transition to the city, they, they have really nowhere else to go, and, and we know the challenges of housing on, on reserves, that they are usually multiple families, and some of them want to have their own space for their family to be, uh, for them to sort of uh, to grow from. And so again, that's, that's uh, over the years, the demand has, has been up. Both levels of government will provide $3.4 million for the new housing located on the north side of Lethbridge. Now, the project is expected to create 25 jobs. In a separate announcement, the province says it will also allocate close to $8 million to support Indigenous-led efforts to support the mental health of residential school survivors and their families. Another candidate has thrown her hat into the ring to become the next mayor of Lethbridge this October. Two-term former city councillor Bridget Mearns made it official on Thursday, saying she's gunning to become our city's first female mayor. Carson Marsouk has that story. A well-known name in Lethbridge is vying for the mayor's chair. Bridget Mearns entered the race on Thursday afternoon. If elected, Mearns would become the first female mayor out of 25 in Lethbridge. My Lethbridge is not defined by our problems, but rather our riches in diversity, culture, trails and parks, world-class post-secondary opportunities, a resilient and supported local economy, and pride in all we are and who we can be. About 50 people joined Mearns at her announcement in support of her decision to run for mayor. Mearns says her goal is to make change in the community. And I watched the last council and I listened to the people of the city who reached out to me to tell me they were tired of a divisive council, tired of progress slowing division created in our city, they wanted change and they wanted to get things done. I saw there was something I have to offer and now is the time for me to make that offer to the citizens of Lethbridge. I want to be their mayor. Mearns has served as a city councillor for two terms before becoming the executive officer of BUILD. If elected, Mearns is dedicating to addressing and tackling homelessness, the opioid crisis and community safety by collaboration rather than confrontation with clear objectives and accountability. As well, Mern says she will support local businesses after a tough year in the pandemic by removing barriers to grow. Another key point made by Mern's is quality of life. I share their vision of a celebrated city with a high quality of life. A city that attracts new businesses and skilled professionals, employs our post-secondary graduates, grows our economy and builds on the success of our agricultural and tech sectors. Mearns is the sixth candidate to file their nomination papers for mayor ahead of the October 18th election. For Bridge City News, I'm Carson Marsouk. From music festivals to business recruitment projects, 11 initiatives are set to benefit this summer with financial support from a new grant. BCN's Naveen Day caught up with some grant recipients along with the originators of the funding. A concept that originated from the heart of our city committee and announced in late May, the reimagined Downtown Activation Grant aims to support downtown businesses, entrepreneurs and organizations in implementing initiatives and events within the downtown. Committee Chair Lorian Johansson says of the 11 projects approved for funding, two are new to the City of Lethbridge, including one that was started by a pair of 15-year-old high school students who saw an opportunity with cigarette butts. The, the cigarette butts that are collected will be recycled and part of that money will be donated to the Interfaith Food Bank. So that's really amazing. We've always wanted to you know, start a business or anything. but uh... Yeah, so we were really fascinated by that kind of Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos type business and we, were, and we really wanted to start something like that and we realized that cigarette butts were something really impactful around Lethbridge and we decided to make a business off that. The cigarette butts are collected in containers that were designed and built by the two boys. Once recycled, one dollar per pound of waste will be donated to the Interfaith Food Bank. Another new initiative will be a business recruitment project that aims to fill vacant storefronts in a pitch competition done in the same style as a popular TV show. The Building Better Business Downtown Project. So this is going to be the 
Lethbridge Dragon's Den style business competition. It will encourage uh, entrepreneurs to put together a proposal, compete for spaces and guidance. Right now we're working with just a few vacant spots. There's all around downtown, which includes like Park Place Mall, um, with Hunter Heggie developments. Um, so we're working with a few of those. The requirements are, we don't have a ton yet. Um, we're still working to kind of fi finalize it and we'll release some details as they come. Total funding available for the Reimagined Downtown Activation Grant this year is $150,000 with applications eligible for up to $25,000. A second intake is taking place in October with more details to follow. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. There's some research being done at the University of Lethbridge which could potentially help those who are battling the COVID-19 virus by simply taking a pill. DJ Kim is a biochemistry master's student at the UofL. He spoke with BCN's Jeanette Roche about the research he's doing to see if a special pill can be created to help those who are battling the virus. We're trying to investigate how COVID uh, interacts with the human protein. So we target the COVID protein that is, uh, has a function of proofreading and protecting. So without this protein functioning properly, uh, the virus will make a lot of mutation on their, uh, when they're replicating themselves. Uh, as you kind of heard from news that the, some mutation in the COVID variant sounds a little scary, yeah. but once we kind of like uh, target this protein, COVID makes a lot of mutation, which will just essentially, the, the COVID cannot survive by itself. So if the virus mutates too much, you're saying it can't survive? Yes. Okay. So uh, all the viruses have a very specific uh, a genetic code in their uh, in themselves. Yeah. But if there's a lot of mutation happen, they just can't survive. Okay. So what is it yeah. that your research is doing that's helping to prevent that from happening? We're okay. forcing them to have more mutation so that they just die off by themselves. In less than three weeks since first being announced, Connecting Our Community Lethbridge has met and surpassed its goal of collecting 200 pairs of shoes, school supplies and backpacks for students going back to school this fall. A new partnership with My City Care was introduced on Thursday, which will allow the initiative to connect with more students across both school divisions and on the reserves. We know that with already the connections that My City Care has with students and with the schools, we are able to expand in greater detail to be able to meet the needs of more students within the community. If, the, if students are already connected with My City Care for backpacks, it is probably also that they are also in need of shoes. So we are standing forward and with them in collaboration so that we can distribute more shoes to them to help even more students in the community and surrounding areas. We knew that this was something that was gonna be a need this year. We were seeing families that were already experiencing extra pressures and financial hardships and working with the collaborations that we've done previously, we know that our numbers this year are projected to be a lot higher. So we've been working really hard to find a shoe partner who would come on board and we're super excited that these guys have stepped up and have kind of filled that role for us in this partnership and collaboration. We are very excited that we get to actually step out and fulfill this for the families. I know previously in years past, we've had some donors that have come in and have filled some of the need, but not all of the need. And right now we have over 900 kids registered through our collaboration for this program. A new goal to collect a thousand pairs of shoes has been set. Pick up for the Shoes for Kids YQL will be held August 14th at Lethbridge College. A concert being held in Lethbridge next Wednesday will have quite the view. The Wide Skies Reimagined event put on by Geomatic Attic will be hosted on the rooftop of the Park and Ride Transit Terminal downtown. The event will feature Leroy Stagger and Monkey Junk, a great blues band. Artistic Director with Geomatic Attic Mike Spencer says the city reached out to them to host the event on top of the park and ride. I think it's just something really unique uh, and people are attracted to things that are kind of maybe out of the box, something, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, is a really memorable experience and a credit to the city once again because I think what they're trying to do is they really want to encourage people to be downtown and they want to use underutilized spaces to do that and I think it's a great uh, step moving forward. So we're, I think we're kind of like a, a pilot project, call it. Geomatic Attic has always tried to be kind of uh, thinking ahead and trying to be put on exciting events and this, um, really feel like this could be one of them. Spencer adds along with the rooftop concert, there will be food trucks and live entertainment in the Bowman Arts Centre parking lot across the street. The event kicks off next Wednesday at 5 o'clock and tickets can be purchased at geomaticattic.ca. You may experience some hootenanny around Galt Gardens this month. 
That's because it's also the name of a comedy troupe that is performing on Rotary Square at Casa. Hootenanny is putting on a free, outdoor, family-friendly play called The Risky Yet Rewarding Adventure of Pearl and Dot. Stage manager for the troupe, Serena Lemire, gives us a glimpse of what the show is all about. It's about two old ladies who are very grumpy and don't like each other, but they really, really want dogs. So they both have a common interest and they get dogs. They lose their dogs, which teach them to love each other and they go and explore an adventure through all of these different places in order to find the dogs. And when you come to the end, the ladies have found the dogs and found a love for each other and become one big happy family. The risky yet rewarding adventure of Pearl and Dot runs Wednesdays through Saturdays till the end of July at Rotary Square at CASA. Showtimes are 10.30 a.m. and 1 in the afternoon. Calgary police are asking for help to identify suspects after 11 churches were recently vandalized in the city. They believe the incidents are linked to unmarked graves being discovered at former residential schools. Police say their churches were vandalized earlier this month with orange and red handprints, the number 215, along with other markings. Police say they understand the trauma felt by the community, but say vandalism to churches could be dangerous to both the person involved and anyone inside. BC officials are in talks with the U.S. and Australia about potential support in fighting the 300 wildfires scorching the province. Premier John Horgan says usual resources from the U.S. may be limited because Washington, Oregon and California are fighting their own fires. The federal government says it is sending 250 Armed Forces personnel to join more than 3,000 firefighters and support staff battling the blazes in B.C. A wildfire burning south of Lake Tahoe, still at zero containment, has crossed the state line from California into Nevada, where new voluntary evacuation orders have been issued. The Tamarack Fire has burned more than 65 square miles. The dry, windy, hot conditions are continuing. There was a, a, some extreme fire activity moving kind of to the north and northeast, which prompted uh, evacuations into Douglas County. Uh, we did see the fire cross over the Nevada state line uh, late yesterday afternoon. Uh, what we're looking at is just out of an abundance of caution, getting some of those uh, residents out of the way. We are daily getting resources in. Uh, it's just sometimes slow to fill orders because we're looking further and further out. Uh, those resources may not be coming locally. They may be coming from much further away. Police have moved in to clear a homeless encampment at a Toronto park. On Wednesday, a large crowd of supporters and legal observers gathered and passed food and water over the orange fences surrounding the area. Uh, people are uh, here and not leaving because they're waiting for permanent housing from the city. That's been the demand this whole time that uh, people have been living out in the, in the encampments. The city is only offering them temporary uh, hotel spots, uh, which are not safe. There are people dying in those shelters. COVID was really bad and spreading in the shelters. Um, and it's just not permanent housing. People are constantly being pushed in and out of them. So that's why people are here asking the city just to fund uh, permanent housing. Instead, what we're seeing is the city putting money into militarization and uh, huge police presence to force people out of the encampments um, when they could be spending that money on permanent housing. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says his government will continue to fight anti-Semitism in all forms. Speaking to participants in the National Summit on Anti-Semitism, Trudeau says the spike in hate crimes is troubling and it's up to everyone to put an end to it. The rise in hate-motivated crimes against the Jewish community in the past few months is not only alarming, it's completely unacceptable. As Jewish Canadians, too many of you have told me you're feeling isolated and vulnerable. You've shared that this spike in violence and this harassment has left people in fear to publicly and proudly live Jewish lives. Well, every Canadian deserves to be and feel safe. And I want to reassure you that our government will always stand with you against this hate. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh says Ottawa should more forcefully regulate online hate speech rather than leave it to social media companies to police themselves. He says doing so would help address concerns from religious groups and visible minority populations. The current existing model is we leave Mark Zuckerberg to do it. Facebook does it. I think that's a bad model. It hasn't worked. They're not doing a good job of it, and they don't have a vested interest in it. They just want to make money. Their goal is how do we get as many eyes as possible on something? How does something get shared as much as possible? How do we increase our revenue through advertising? There's not a 
a desire or a interest in actually protecting people. So that's one option that has failed. And I think it's incumbent on Canadians to have a say about what is appropriate and what's not. And the way we have a say is we've got elected officials and we can bring in legislation that regulates online hate. It should be the government's responsibility. This is the 20th anniversary of a book that touched so many people's lives. It was 20 years ago that Prayers That Heal the Heart was released. It was re-released recently, and the book's author, Mark Verkler, says the timing of its release was important coming out of the pandemic and to explain how to know when a hurt has been healed. Well, the biggest hurt of my adult life probably was being fired from a being on pastoral staff of a church of 3,000 people, and I loved it and wanted to work there the rest of my life. And when I got fired, it was very traumatic. I asked Jesus to show up at the table where they fired me. He showed up in a scene inside my mind, a picture that came drifting in, which is a vision. He's laughing hilariously and slapping his feet and legs. And I said, what is so funny? He said, Mark, don't you know I set this whole thing up? I said, I'll get mad at you. Don't tell me that. He said, Mark, I've told you for two years to get on the road and teach the church how to hear my voice. You didn't go, so I just kicked you out. And I said, well, I was going to go. I was just afraid I uh, couldn't live off financial, you know, free will offerings. And I wanted to pay off some bills first and get some money in the bank. And he said, you'd have never got your bills paid off. So I just threw you out of the mess because you weren't going to go. And he said, look, you can see these men who fired you as evil men, or you can see them as instruments in my hand who thrust you into the fulfillment of your destiny. And if you see them as instruments in my hand, you can feel honor and respect and love because they did for you what you were too afraid to do for yourself. So now a hurt is healed because I see the gift that God's produced in my life through the experience. That was Mark Verkler, author of the book, Prayers That Heal the Heart. While many of us have been praying for healing upon our land with so many wildfires burning, and it was great to see the smoky conditions leave our region for now, we should be seeing mainly clear skies and warmer temperatures over the next few days. A complete look at the weather forecast is coming up. It was so great to see the hazy and smoky conditions leave our region with the warmer temperatures returning once again. Jeanette Roche is here with a look at the long range weather forecast. Jeanette, lots of sunshine is on tap this week, but so is some of that famous Lethbridge wind. Yeah, we had some wind gusts up to 50 kilometers per hour today. That should remain overnight as well and then into tomorrow a bit windy as well. Uh, a southwest wind at 30 kilometer per hour is what we are looking at for tomorrow, Friday, uh, with the uh, clouds sort of coming in a little bit in the morning, giving us a mix of sun and clouds. Should be a bit hazy tomorrow as well. High of 25 though, and then for the rest of the week, we are looking at beautiful sunny skies. 26 is our high for Saturday, up to 30 on a Sunday. Should be a beautiful day. 27 on Monday with lots of sunshine and up to 31 on a Tuesday. Uh, rounding out that seven day forecast next Wednesday with a mix of sun and cloud and 28 degrees. So we are looking at beautiful, beautiful temperatures, keeping us higher than that 26 degree average for this time of year. Average low, 11 degrees, 37 was our high temperature on this day back in 1938. And in 1984, we had our chilliest, which was four degrees only. 549 is when the sun rose this morning, sunset this evening, 927 p.m., giving us less than 16 hours, but still uh, still lots of daylight out there. Over on the west coast, looking at 22, the high for Victoria, cooler uh, by the water, of course, 23 in Vancouver. Uh, lots of sunshine in Edmonton tomorrow, 23 degrees. Edmonton's where it's going to be a little more windy, though, up to 40 kilometer per hour wind gusts. 25 tomorrow, the high in Calgary with a partly cloudy skies, not too bad. We're looking at some local smoke happening um, in all three of these prairie cities here, Saskatoon, Regina, and Winnipeg tomorrow. Saskatoon looking at some wind gusts up to 60K as well. 25 the high, uh, 27 the high for Regina with uh, some local smoke. Winnipeg also looking at a 30% uh, chance of showers with that local smoke as well. Lots of sunshine expected tomorrow in Toronto, 26 the high, 26 also the high in uh, Ottawa, and 27 will be the high temperature in Montreal tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud for those two cities. Uh, we're looking at 60% chance of showers with a risk of thunderstorms in Fredericton, Halifax, and Charlottetown tomorrow. These temperatures, Fredericton 24, 22 in Halifax, 21, Charlottetown 15 degrees in St. John's with a 60% chance of showers and up to 40 kilometer per hour wind gusts. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Today's weather is brought to you rain or shine by the gym in the north. Top notch equipment and customized classes in Lethbridge's north end. 
Johnson & Johnson is recalling a couple of spray-on sunscreens after testing revealed elevated levels of benzene. The recall applies to Neutrogena Beach Defense and Ultra Sheer Aerosol Sunscreens for both adults and kids. Health Canada says consumers should stop using the products and warn that increased use has been linked to serious health risks, including leukemia and other cancers. In a release, Johnson & Johnson says benzene is not an active ingredient in their sunscreens, but low levels were detected in some samples of certain aerosol sunscreen finished products. Precision Drilling says its second quarter net loss was 55% higher than a year ago, but the outlook for the Canadian market remains bright over the next 12 months. The Calgary-based contract drilling company says it lost close to $76 million. It says revenues increased 6.1% to $201.4 million due to higher oil and natural gas prices that strengthen energy fundamentals. The results missed analysts' expectations, but it says its Canadian well service business is up five-fold from last July, supported by strong commodity prices and the Canadian Well Abandonment Program. Amazon has cancelled its 2021 Prime Day marketing event in Canada after postponing it earlier this year. A spokesperson says the retail giant made the decision because of the impact COVID had on its operations. Amazon partially closed three Canadian distribution centres in May following positive COVID-19 tests by employees. The online shopping event featuring discounted products was delayed across North America last year from July to October, but went ahead in the U.S. last month. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 12 points on the day to finish at 20,098. The Dow was up 25 points to 34,823. The S&P 500 was up 8 points to 4,367. And the Nasdaq was up 52 points to 14,685. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up $1.43 to 71.73 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 4 cents to $4 US. Gold was up a cent to 1806.93 US an ounce. And silver was also up a cent to 25.44 US an ounce. Wheat is at $400 per metric ton. Barley's also at $400. Canola's at $881. And corn is at $430 per metric ton. Live cattle were up 75 cents to 120.80. Feeder cattle were up $1.43 to 158.20. And lean hogs were up 8 cents to 106.65. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 79.59 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, Premier Jason Kenney announced today that his government would be investing around $150 million to improve broadband in both rural and Indigenous communities. Kenny says that around 201,000 Alberta households, or around 12% of the population, do not have access to target speed set out by the CRTC. Should Albertans be allowed to carry pepper spray for self-defense? Alberta's Justice Minister Casey Madhu seems to think so. And our legislative reporter Tyler Dawson will have more details for us in just a moment. Here's your Bridge City News community calendar. The Lethbridge Senior Citizens Organization is urgently looking for volunteers to take part in their Drive Happiness program. This program is to help seniors in our community who are facing extreme loneliness due to lack of accessible transportation. Volunteers will drive clients to their medical appointments, pick up groceries, and take them to important life activities. If you're interested in this opportunity and for more information, call 403-332-4320 or email volunteer at volunteerlethbridge.com. For their 10th anniversary season, the Lethbridge Shakespeare Performance Society is presenting two showings of A Midsummer Night's Dream at Nikayuko Japanese Garden. Experience outdoor theater with the beautiful setting of Nikayuko as the stage. Performance dates are July 23rd and August 13th. Gates open at 7 p.m. with the show beginning at 7.30. Tickets are $20 per person and must be purchased in advance. For more details and tickets, visit nikayuko.com. And that's your Bridge City News community calendar. Alberta's Justice Minister Casey Medu has written to the federal government asking that Albertans be allowed to carry pepper spray in self-defense. To talk about this in more detail is our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson. Tyler, last time I checked, though, pepper spray was a prohibited weapon in Canada unless you're a police officer. 
Yeah, that's that's totally right. You cannot really carry and use pepper spray that's intended to be used against humans. So Casey Madhu, as you say, has written to the federal justice minister asking that this rule be changed, you know, looking at some of the attacks against vulnerable people that we've seen in Alberta in the last little while, um, and basically arguing that, that this should be a, a self-defense option for people, you know, walking the streets of uh, major cities and whatnot. Um, you know, balls in the federal government's court, of course, on whether or not they would go ahead and make a change like this. But, you know, I think it's interesting in the context of a presumably upcoming federal election, um, whether or not some of these ideas that the UCP has might not be picked up by their uh, their um, contemporaries, perhaps, in the federal conservative party, who uh, I think it would be fair to say have seemed a little light on big ideas in the last little while. Um, and so maybe the UCP is doing a little bit of that uh, heavy lifting for them. I'm wondering maybe if uh, Casey Mudu will take it to the next level, Alberta's Justice Minister from pepper spray to maybe tasers. How about Albertans get a chance to carry tasers around and, hey buddy, and, well maybe not, maybe it's not such a good idea. Now speaking of Mudu, Tyler, he's calling for mandatory minimum sentences for hate-based attacks. He recently pointed to the examples of attacks in our province, including, hey, the burning of some of our churches. He suggests that these two proposals will help deter such crime. Yeah, so he's calling for mandatory minimums on some of these crimes um, and, and also referencing specifically some of the tax against Muslim women in Alberta in the last little while. Now, the federal conservatives, of course, have long been big fans of mandatory minimum uh, penalties for all sorts of crimes. Um, the, the research, shall we say, on them is, is mixed. Courts have not been super fond of some of these things in recent years, you know, particularly in the, in the aftermath of sort of the Harper conservatives, uh, tough on crime agendas. But, you know, it, it's interesting because this proposal for a mandatory minimum is something that perhaps progressives could get behind. Um, and, and once again, this is not a policy proposal that we're going to see come up in the Alberta legislature, because as our viewers know, um, criminal law is a federal responsibility. So Madhu is, you know, in both of these proposals, um, trying to push the federal government into coming up with some ways perhaps to, to protect um, vulnerable Canadians a little bit more. Now, Minister Madhu Tyler is touring the province right now, including right here in southern Alberta, to hear about rural crime and get some feedback on what the government has done so far to improve response times. He will also be updating us on a study to potentially replace the RCMP with a provincial police force. The rural crime issue is, is really the issue that never seems to end in Alberta politics. I mean, I feel like we kind of haven't talked that much about it over the course of the pandemic. But if we think back to the 2019 election and right before that and right after that, there was considerable conversation about rural crime. Um, and Madhu clearly, you know, now that the pandemic is easing, is getting back into some of those files to discuss it. Um, the provincial police force is a notable one because of the RCMP union, which is really pushing quite hard to keep the RCMP in Alberta. Um, the RCMP police is geographically probably the majority of Alberta, but certainly not the majority of the population. Um, but it is a proposal that's out there. And this is part of this sort of idea, idea from the Fair Deal panel that there should be um, institutions that are more responsive to the concerns uh, that Albertans might have, um, and, and perhaps a provincial police force um, would be a better way to tackle some of the concerns that rural communities in particular have. Now, has the UCP also come forward saying that maybe the RCMP, with the response times, they don't know the province as well as, let's say, maybe a provincial police force would? Yeah, that's certainly part of the idea that there are concerns in rural Alberta that are different than there might be in other parts of the country. And that, you know, the RCMP, when you join the RCMP, um, you don't get to say, hey, look, my hometown is, you know, Cardston. Can I go work there? Um, you get sort of placed wherever you get placed. So you, you do have people policing First Nations reserves, small town Alberta, um, northern Alberta, northern Canada, for that matter, who come from all over the country and who might not be as familiar with the local culture concerns and, um, and contexts, I guess, that, that they're going to be working in. Now, Tyler, we've had a very dry, hot summer so far, and we've seen a lot of drought here in the West, especially here in southwestern Alberta. Many farmers are hurting. Now, the province is working with Ottawa on a new initiative to help our producers called the Agra Recovery Program. How does that work? 
Yeah, so it's a, it's a cost sharing program basically to sort of help out farmers uh, get to the end of the season. And the way it would work is sort of 60% of costs of the program would be borne by the federal government, 40% by the province. Details on this are, are quite slim. Um, Agriculture Minister Devin Dreeshen mentioned it recently. And um, clearly they're working on something. And there's also some discussion, I believe, about whether or not some crop insurance um, estimates are going to happen earlier than normal because people already are dealing with failing crops and trying to decide about whether or not, you know, they're just going to turn them over for, for animal feed. Um, so, you know, it's been a, a very rough season for farmers across Alberta. And I mean, it's, 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 it's still early, it, you know, mid late July. Um, and already people are looking at failing crops. So doubtless there's going to be some sort of provincial federal government action on that in, in the coming days or weeks, I would expect. Um, but at this point, details are, are fairly thin on that front. Yeah, we've got to keep praying for rain for a lot of our farmers, our producers here in Alberta. Now, Tyler, the UCP has fulfilled one of its longtime promises to create an Alberta parole board. It'll handle cases of those serving two years or less. How will this really impact, as we mentioned er earlier, a lot of the victims of rural crime? Well, that's the thing. We don't exactly know. Um, the Alberta Parole Board is up and running. However, we don't know what decisions they've made. Now, the National Parole Board, which manages more serious offenses and previously also managed these lower tier offenses in Alberta, publishes its decisions. Uh, you can request to see a parole board decision on an offender. Um, for example, there's stories that come out about Paul Bernardo, for example, uh, when he's applied for parole. Now, the Alberta Parole Board, they're just not releasing those decisions. So th the purpose of the parole board, in part, was to have a more responsive parole board that was concerned about a revolving door justice system, offenders being let out early, things like that. Um, but of course, without seeing those decisions, we don't know what decisions they're actually making. So it's sort of a fairly straightforward transparency issue in some ways. Um, you know, people have argued against the idea of a provincial parole board, uh, which those arguments are are what they are. But the issue right now seems to be that we just we just don't know what they're deciding. So it's it's a very interesting move. Um, you know, if the purpose of this parole board was to ensure that parole decisions were responsive to the concerns of Albertans, but we don't know what those decisions are, it, it's sort of hard to see how that promise is you know fulfilled in the end. I would say. Coal mining is back in the news, Tyler. Opposition leader Rachel Notley would like to see new legislation passed to ban coal mining on the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies. Meanwhile, the Pakani First Nation and Benga Mining are seeking an appeal of the decision to shut down the Grassy Mountain Coal Project. Tell me more about that. That's right. So they are basically seeking an appeal on that decision, saying that, uh, you know, there are economic reasons why the First Nation wants it um, and, and going going through that sort of process, looking to see what the steps are. But of course, on the political side, you know, I feel like we talk about this every couple of weeks. Um, the coal mining thing is still a very um, tense political issue that, of course, has brought in country music stars like Corb Lund and Paul Brandt to discuss it, um, pitted sort of the UCP government against small town mayors for a little period of time there back in the spring, I suppose it was. And Rachel Notley, had, the, the NDP had previously proposed a ban on coal mining on the eastern slopes of the Rockies, and that didn't really go anywhere um, before the sort of spring session of the legislature ended. But she has now promised that, you know, when the legislature comes back in the fall, that she's going to attempt um, to, to bring forward a ban of that sort again, um, seems like a very politically salient topic right now for people all across the province. And also, you know, building some interesting bridges between small town rural Albertans and uh, and New Democrats in the city. So it, it, that's going to be one, I think, to watch for sure once uh, once normal returns and once politicians are uh, back at it in, in the fall. Now, Tyler, the Alberta NDP are calling out staff shortages in Alberta hospitals. Uh, there were reductions in bed availabilities in emergency departments recently. Now, the party is linking the issue to a fight between the Kenny government and nursing unions over wages. But the AHS says, you know, shortages are simply because nurses are taking some much-needed time off vacations after the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a whole host of sort of things percolating at the same time here. Certainly a large part of the drama is the negotiations between nursing unions and the health ministry. Um, recently, it was reported that the health ministry and AHS were pushing for a 3% pay reduction for some nurses um, in order to deal sort of with budget issues. The New Democrats, of course, and the nursing unions seizing on that, saying that, you know, this is an attack on healthcare workers. This is going to lead to people leaving the province, going to lead to shortages, et cetera, et cetera. 
with regard to the specific issue of shortages, um, the government has basically said that the NDP is blowing this out of proportion and that, yeah, it's, it's vacation time, that people are finally taking some time off, and that's why there isn't enough staff to keep all these beds open. Um, wherever one falls on that issue, clearly it's going to be a very, very hot political topic going into through the rest of the summer, I expect, and going into the fall as well. Um, Jason Kenney also saying recently that if nursing if nurses are going to get the raises that they want, it's going to require raising taxes um, and basically suggesting that union bosses are going to need to t tighten their belts a bit. So this, you know, like the coal mining thing, I, I don't think we're going to see this drama go away anytime soon. Have Premier Kenny or Health Minister Tyler Chandra also addressed and talked about the doctor shortage here in the province? They have addressed it. Um, whether or not they've come up with a strategy to prevent it, um, I, I don't think they have. Not that is leaping immediately to mind for me. Um, there is, however, the proposals that they'd had from maybe a year ago now, basically, where they were suggesting that recently graduated medical students would be assigned to specific areas to try and deal with some of these shortages. Um, so say you graduate from med school, you want to be in Edmonton or Calgary, but they need a doctor in, um, uh, in I don't know, a small town somewhere. Um, they, they could send them there to work for a period of time. So there are some of those measures. Um, but again, I think that's probably going to be another one of these longer term issues that people are going to be keeping an eye on. And without a doubt, um, the NDP is going to be making some political hay with, uh, with this, this issue. Because I know here in Lethbridge, no doctors are accepting new patients. You know, my wife is looking for a doctor right now, not even a potential possibility. They say you have to go to like Cardston, which is about an hour away on the way to Waterton. So, or even go to Calgary to try and find yourself a doctor. That's unheard of. You can't find a doctor in a city of over 100,000 people. Tyler, the NDP are also pushing for an in-school vaccination program for the COVID-19 vaccine. Apparently less than half of all students between the ages of 14 and 19 have had both of their shots. Some are saying we could potentially see a new wave involving teenagers. That's the fear. It, it, you know, the fear is that the pandemic is going to sort of linger in the background to some extent and and work through those who don't have their full vaccines. And with numbers that low among school aged people who are also eligible for the vaccine, um, the idea is that they should be getting vaccinated as soon as possible. And, and one way to address that would be to have an in school vaccination program. Um, I, I certainly would not be surprised if that's the sort of thing that we do see in, in coming weeks, because shockingly, you know, we're only like six weeks away from back to school, which, you know, gives me flashback symptoms just thinking about it, I have to say. Yeah, you're not very popular with a lot of students right now enjoying their summer holidays. Tyler, daylight savings time and the equalization referendum will be front and center on the ballot during the municipal elections coming up in October. Equalization is a fulfillment of a fair deal panel promise and turfing daylight savings has gained a lot of momentum. That's right. You know, I, I'm a, I can't, I have to admit, I'm a bit of a fan of the daylight savings thing. I like to gain that uh, extra hour. Um, but it is apparently wildly unpopular. And some of our neighbors, such as Saskatchewan, and I believe the Yukon as well, have gotten rid of it. So that's going to be on the ballot. And of course, the equalization thing, which will, Jason Kenney is basically saying that if it passes, he then has a mandate to negotiate over equalization with Ottawa. The big question, of course, on that front is A, whether or not it will pass. And B, if it does pass, whether or not Ottawa is actually obligated to negotiate with the Alberta government about it. So that's a little bit of an open question. The government insists that it does give them the mandate. It does oblige Ottawa to negotiate. But certainly that's going to be a big political issue going forward if that referendum uh, passes. Something tells me we may end up in court when this is all said and done. Our legislative reporter and the Alberta correspondent with the National Post, Tyler Dawson, thanks for joining me today from Edmonton. Always a pleasure, Hal. Well, there's so much discussion in our world today about racism, and recently an interesting claim in an article has been trying to get some traction that's denying evolution is a form of, of white supremacy. So joining us from Southern California to share the details is Dr. Fuzzle Rana, the Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe. He is a biochemist and is the author of Thinking About Evolution. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rana. Thanks so much for having me. It's so kind of you to bring me on. Oh, absolutely. Now, can you explain where this idea comes from that denial of evolution is a form of white supremacy? Yeah, well, you know, as you pointed out, uh, there was an article published just recently 
uh, as an op-ed piece for Scientific American by Allison Hooper, where she made that very strong claim. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that over the years, organizations like the National Center for Science Education, which is an evolution advocacy group in an anti-creationist organization, has tried to establish an association between creationism and racism, but they've never gone so far as to say that there is a direct a correlation or a direct cause. And so this is you know, something that Allison Hooper has done that, that has really pushed things, I think, to the extreme. Yeah, interesting. So is it true that biblical creation suggests a white Adam and Eve? I mean, we don't actually know their race or color of their skin, do we? Was that ever documented? Yeah, that's a, a really important question. And the whole idea of, uh, of, you know, again, creationism being connected with racism and white supremacy really stems back to the mid-1800s in the United States when you had uh, Christians who were pro-slavery trying to produce an apologetic justifying slavery based on the biblical text. And as part of that, they made the argument that people of dark skin either reflected the mark of Cain or the curse of Ham with the idea that, uh, that people with dark skin were uh, not favored by God and that people with white skin were in a better standing with God. And that was used to justify slavery. Of course, at that time, there were also Christians who were abolitionists who countered that really flawed interpretation of you know, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Uh, but this idea sadly has persisted into the 20th century after the emancipation, and uh, particularly in the South among fundamentalists and evangelicals. So this is where that association comes from. But as you're pointing out, uh, the biblical text isn't that specific. It doesn't tell us anything about the physical appearance of Adam and Eve or Cain and Abel or any of, of, of the human beings that we encounter in Scripture, any of the characters we encounter in Scripture. It, the text is silent about their physical appearance. So uh, uh, any idea of where racial diversity comes from from the biblical text is an inference at best. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So you're saying ge geographically and histor historically, the Bible actually doesn't say anything about, you know, Adam and Eve's, what they actually first looked like, does it? That's an interesting point that you make. So did the author of this article consider the fact that there may very well be more non-white humans who believe in creationism, creationism rather, as compared to white people? You know, again, a, a very strong point. You know, I don't have the precise statistics in front of me, but there's about 2.3 billion people in the world that are Christians. Uh, this is about a third of the world's population. And I think you, it's safe to say a roughly two thirds of those uh, people that identify with Christianity would be considered to be non-white. And, and of course, creation is a central doctrine in Christianity. And if that's the case, then you have you know, a significant portion of the world's population, maybe 1.4, 1.5 billion people who are non-white, who would believe that God created human beings uh, in his image. And so uh, that's a creationist position. So uh, just simply the, the population uh, statistics, you know, argue against the idea that uh, creationism is a form of white supremacy. And by the way, just as an interesting aside, uh, there's about 2 billion Muslims in the world, and Muslims are creationists as well, and many Muslims, again, would be considered non-white. So when you add Islam into the mix, uh, there's a significant portion of the non-white world that would hold to some version of creation where there is an Adam and an Eve that all humanity comes from. Very, very interesting point that you make there, Dr. Rana. Now, the article professes that the first wave of legal fights against the teaching of evolution were by the KKK. Therefore, affirming creationism devalues people of color. So on the other hand, you, Dr. Rana, believe that it's Darwinian evolution that minimizes the value of all humans as where the biblical human origins model it sort of elevates it. So can you explain that a little bit more? Yes. And, you know, it is true that the KKK was the first organization historically to oppose teaching evolution in 
the classroom. Uh, but the KKK had an interesting set of views where some of their ideas they bolstered from, again, this slave apologetics, but other ideas they were appropriating was from social Darwinism, you know, where they saw uh, essentially natural selection being the, the reason why white groups were superior to people of color. And to interfere with that would be to, to go against the natural order of things. Uh, and so the KKK had a really interesting amalgam of views. Uh, but what is missed in this article is that uh, it's not just simply people that espouse uh, creationism that held white supremacist views. So did evolutionary biologists who were part of human uh, evolutionary anthropology. Uh, if you go back in the history of anthropology, all the way back to Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, you see Darwin espousing really white supremacist ideas where he believed that the different racial groups were evidence that human beings evolved and that people of color were actually not as far as, far evolved as white Europeans. And in fact, Darwin refers to non-white people groups as savages, where he argues that they were uh, intellectually and morally inferior to white Europeans. They lacked self-command. And he even argues for British imperialism on the basis of the difference in, he saw capabilities between different racial groups. Or if you continue, you have the ideas of Herbert Spencer and social Darwinism that again, espoused the form of white supremacy. Or you look at Carlton Kuhn and his ideas of multi-regionalism and identifying not only different racial groups, but then ranking them based on skin color uh, according to how far evolved he considered them to be, where again, of course, white Europeans were more evolved. So this idea of white supremacy is the issue where you see people appropriating uh, science or appropriating the biblical text to try to justify white supremacist views. Uh, whereas I think neither actually uh, scientifically or biblically support uh, you know, those views. And it's really Christianity uh, that views all human beings being made in God's image coming from a historical Adam and Eve that ultimately, I think, give you justification for seeing racial unity and racial harmony in the world. Oh, that's interesting. By the way, what do we know about these white supremacists? Is there any evidence that the majority of them actually believe in creationism? You know, I, I really uh, don't know the answer to that really good question. Uh, I'm not an expert by, by any means on the different white supremacist groups, but I would imagine that ultimately these groups are going to have to justify their beliefs in white supremacy based on probably some kind of amalgam of a distorted view of scripture and really a, a type of social Darwinism, where again, you would see the white race as being more evolved. So again, it, very similar to how the KKK would, would justify white supremacy. That would be my, my guess. Mm -hmm. So for viewers who may doubt creation, are you able to share a few thoughts on some scientific, logical reasons why they maybe wouldn't believe in Darwinian evolution? Well, I mean, the first thing that you see when you look at biological systems is this overwhelming appearance of design and design for a purpose. And of course, if something appears to be designed for a purpose, maybe indeed it has been. And so it's completely reasonable, I think, to look at biological systems and think that there is a mind, a creator that's responsible for those systems. But on top of that, there are certain aspects of evolutionary biology that are not well evidenced. Uh, for example, when it, we look at the key transitions in life's history, the origin of life, the origin of what are called eukaryotic cells, the origin of complex multicellularity in animals and, and hence the origin of body plans or the origin of consciousness or even the origin of, of human exceptionalism. None of these areas have robust, valid evolutionary explanations. And in fact, the researchers that work in these areas will be the first to acknowledge we don't have an explanation for these important transitions. So to be skeptical of, of at least aspects of the evolutionary paradigm isn't unreasonable, and to see a creator's handiwork uh, in the creation, again, is completely reasonable. Interesting. Now, do you know if belief in creation is on the rise or on the decline in North America? 
uh, it's pretty much held steady over the last 40 or 50 years. I mean, today, I think the latest statistics I saw was about 40% of people would say that Adam and Eve were created in their, uh, or human beings, I'm sorry, were created in their current form. They would hold to a historical Adam and Eve. About 35% of people say God used evolution as a way to create. Uh, so, you know, roughly three-fourths of the U.S. population hold to some version of creationism. Uh, and, and it's really about 25% of people that see evolution as unguided. And those numbers have largely remained constant over the last 40 years. Maybe about 40 years ago, the numbers would be slightly higher for people that espoused the view that uh, humanity was created in it. Uh, in its original form from a historical Adam and Eve. Uh, so it's a slight dip, but it's not uh, that much of a change. So a significant part of the U.S. population holds to some version of creationism. All right. Well, it looks like we're about out of time, but thank you so much for your time today and your, your opinions and your expertise on that, Dr. Rana. My pleasure. Absolutely. Dr. Fuzzle Rana is the Vice President of Research and Apologetics at Reasons to Believe and is the author of Thinking About Evolution at www.reasons.org. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks for watching.